thanks for uh, taking the time to sit here, and it's, it's a real honor and, and pleasure to be uh, to be speaking to you. I've been watching your stuff for years, so yeah, pleasure. No, I like doing this. Yeah. yeah. So I would love to just have an informal flow conversation. It doesn't have to get too technical mm -hmm. or too mm -hmm. scientific. Um, and just see what comes up. I have some ideas that I want to speak about, but I mainly just want to go with the flow. Um, mm. So I would love to hear how, how you got started in this world of detox and health and, and how it all began. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, really my, my sort of upbringing in, in medicine started, you know, in Germany. And um, I, I was fortunately, you know, while I studied medicine, um, there wasn't the hard boundary between alternative medicine and conventional medicine. We had um, compulsory courses in homeopathy and acupuncture, uh, manual therapy. And so by the time I graduated from medical school, I had a pretty good working understanding of classic homeopathy and acupuncture and auricular medicine, a lot of the things that now considered alternative. Now that was the last year, I graduated, it was the last year whether it was part of medical school <laughs> um, before the pharmaceutical interest hit and so and um, I also had the f fortune in a way my mother was a medical doctor you know and she was totally steeped in alternative medicine of, of her time and I grew up in the same near the same village just a five kilometers apart from Dr. Foll he developed the electroacupuncture according to Dr. Foll or EAV now called electrodermal testing, which is really <clears throat> the mother of uh, uh, diagnostic work in alternative medicine. And, and Dr. Fuller was my doctor when I was growing up. And so I thought energy medicine was medicine and everything else was alternative. Uh, you know, so I didn't know. And then, you know, I uh, moved to India after shortly, you know, after medical school, I studied psychology and did a thesis in, uh, in really vascular medicine, it's called angiology. Um, I completed that and then did a, a residency in surgery. I so loved the technical part of, of medicine. <clears throat> and then moved to India for a couple of years and worked as a medical doctor there. It was at the time uh, considered part of a, a residency program in general medicine. And so I did that and in India, you know, so we had contact with virtually physicians from all over the world, you know, that I learned about herbal medicine from Australia and I learned about whatever chiropractic is, you know, because it didn't exist in Europe at the time and, and osteopathy um, and and really learned the, uh, the, the medical systems outside the mainstream medical system. and. Um, so that over time, you know, I, I learned how to work with magnets, and I learned how to uh, to work with microcurrent, and, and pretty much everything that's there now that in alternative medicine. I I just knew earlier through my through accident, really. Um, and so by the time I moved to the U.S., that was in 1982. I had a pretty well-rounded understanding of biophysics. You know how to use rather than using biochemistry to use physics uh, in healing. And I, I consider acupuncture to belong there, and I also consider homeopathy an application of physics rather than biochemistry. And so by extension, you know, sort of, I was highly sensitized, you know, when, um, when Wi-Fi became the uh, state of the art in the telecommunications industry, I was highly sensitized towards the dan possible dangers of that because I already knew what frequency bands could be used for healing. And when I looked at what frequency used for, for Wi-Fi, they were highly destructive. And so I, I had an understanding maybe early on, earlier than, than many people, uh, about the dangers and so on, and tried to be as vocal as I could be <laughs> about that to educate at least my individual patients. And that has been a very rewarding strategy, you know, that we realize basically that most uh, chronic illness is actually acquired illness through 
uh, mistakes made in our environment, things that are completely unnecessary, like the use of glyphosate or the um, the use of certain frequency bands in, in the cell phone industry or um, certain chemicals in a household or you know, the fluoridation of the drinking water. The list is not that long, you know, of just basic mistakes that, that have been made and the statistics are on my side, you know, sort of that uh, when recent polls were taken on health in Western countries that America always comes in last. <laughs> and so confirming, you know, that the, the things that we're doing that we take for granted are just not compatible with a healthy lifestyle or healthy longevity. And so, and at the same time, we're traveling forth and back between Australia, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Russia, and other places. I see what is in place in terms of technology in other countries and what they're using for healing. and. Um, kind of realize, you know, sort of that America has the loudest voice because most of the medical journals and the communications industry is controlled by the U.S. The loudest voice with the least amount of knowledge behind it, you know. So it's like, um, like a drunk, you know, preaching to the uh, to the crowd. And so I, I try to have a voice. I love America. I love that, you know. I feel the Americans are. Uh, by and large, you know, the, the probably the most good-hearted people on the planet, you know, and um, I love being here and I see the beautiful future for the country, but there's some things that have gone wrong here, and so I try to have my voice in hopefully um, there will be enough of us uh, over the next few years to make, uh, to tip the scales into, into a good direction. Uh, I gotta fix that mic, it's itching me. There we go. Okay. So what do you think is what do you think is really happening in this world? Like, you know, most conventional people are under the impression that it's if you have depression or anxiety or some sort of illness, it's either, you know, you've caught a bacteria or you have neurotransmitter imbalance. What, what do you feel if you had to take a big step back and see it all? Do you think it's a matter of light versus dark? What, what, what's the, the biggest scope you can say that's happening on the world? Well, uh, of course, you know, that's, um, I, I could give many answers yeah. uh, uh, to that, but I think um, light versus dark um, is the shortest way of expressing it. You know, I, I in, in different lectures that I give, you know, so I make it very clear. We don't have to go into the details. In uh, Rudolf Steiner, you know, the the Austrian uh, mystic that was very active in the early part of the last century, the, the founder of Waldorf schools and biodynamic farming and, and a, a completely new kind of alternative medicine, he um, predicted, you know, that uh, towards the end of last century, in the beginning of the century, there will be a movement driven by big corporations to take the soul away from people, to disconnect people from the higher world. And in order to do that, we have to um, destroy the pineal gland in people. And I followed the research on that, and amazingly what we found, uh, the pineal gland is the most sensitive part of our central nervous system and is highly, highly, highly sensitive to four things. Aluminum, <laughs> glyphosate, fluoride, and Wi-Fi. And we are the only country in the world that has pushed these four things in the last 60 years or so on everybody growing up here. And so what I feel, what I observe, and what we're also testing on our ART system is that people have calci severely calcified uh, pineal glands. And uh, I, I show the anatomy in some of my courses, you know, it's very clear that the pineal gland is a receiver for higher fields of energy and translates them into thought and into actually controlling our 
the immune system, our endocrine system, and, and so on and so forth. There's all science, you know, but very few people pay attention to science anymore, especially since Donald Trump <laughs> and his disregard for science. Um, we, it's become the new norm, and so um, it, it is astounding that the telecommunications industry has selected the frequencies out of the huge spectrum of frequencies that are absolutely destructive to our cells and especially to the pineal gland. You know, you couldn't have made any better choices than 2.4 gigahertz. Um, that the end point that when you have inhaled aluminum, as we do from the geoengineering program, and uh, have glyphosate in the food chain, that glyphosate and aluminum combine in the blood and in the, in the gut and in the bloodstream to form six different uh, chemical compounds uh, that where aluminum and glyphosate are hooked up together. And the end point of that compound is the pineal gland, published, you know, it's not my idea. And uh, what is needed for this compound to actually enter the brain is to open up the blood-brain barrier. And the current frequencies in the Wi-Fi world are exactly doing that, to open the blood-brain barrier, so toxins they used to stay in the bloodstream and in the body below the neck are now entering the brain very freely. That, that applies to all toxins. Um, and so it's a new time in that way. You know? And, so, and um, when you think this through, um, you come to the conclusion that either there must, be, there must have been an ultra-intelligence group of scientists who have designed this protocol to fluoridate the drinking water to put nanonized aluminum in the air, to put glyphosate in the food, and then activate it, spark it with the right frequencies. It almost, I could, it took me 20 years to figure out the perfect storm that is created there. And it's either a coincidence, which is possible, that enough dumb people made the wrong choices, you know, along the years. I'm still hoping that that may be at least part, partially true or it's orchestrated by a very, very intelligent group of destructive minds. Or what I also believe is very possible that there's some higher fields of consciousness that can be both tuned into the light and to life affirmative action and can be absolutely destructive, like phenomena like Adolf Hitler and others, people that come under the influence of something absolutely dark and destructive. And I do believe it's very possible that enough scientists and politicians have come under the influence of those higher fields and are acting according to it, actually not knowing on a human level why they're doing what they're doing and what they're doing. You know, that the, now we, you know, we, a good example is 5G, you know, sort of, um, to put it on posts, you know, along the streets, okay, that's one issue, but putting it on satellite and actually the government approving to put it on satellite, I mean, blasting the whole planet with a frequency that has never been checked for safety for its influence on the insects, on the songbirds, on the, has never been checked for anything. And to approve that is unconceivable to like somebody who's still got a little bit of a brain left and uh, that, uh, politicians in the White House and other countries are conspiring or with that um, can only be explained that their brains have come under the influence of some larger, higher field uh, that cannot be human in nature, you know, because the, the human nature is always life affirmative and loving and wanting to, wanting to live and make the biosphere more friendly to life. And so, so there is some scary thoughts about that, you know, but I'm still hoping, I'm still putting my weight on, let's hope it's just a coincidence and enough dumb people made enough dumb decisions and and um, if enough of us wake up and point it out to them that there can be a reversal, you know, the Wi-Fi can be switched off in a second, <laughs> we'd be done with that and, you know, glyphosate could be forbidden, you know, tomorrow. It's in the water table for many years, but there could be an end uh, to it. You know, the chemtrail program could be stopped like that. 
you know, so the, the good thing is that um, solutions, positive solutions that are suppressed right now, that are everywhere, could be the norm of tomorrow. Within 24 hours, we could turn the planet from um, a creature that is threatened on all levels to paradise, you know, virtually within 24 hours. You know, we're still close enough to that. You know, the summer I spent uh, time uh, kayaking uh, in the w largest wilderness area in the continental U.S. Uh, in Idaho. And when we, you know, you fly to Boise, Idaho, and then you take a small plane that only seats like four or five people to the input, you know, we put the boat into the, the river and you fly for like two hours over this wilderness area. And I saw that two thirds of the trees were dead. It just looked like flying over an endless graveyard. Had the same experience, you know, being in Colorado uh, two years ago, you know, driving through the Rocky Mountains, seeing nothing but dead forests. I think things are much closer, you know, to a tipping point where we need to make some very significant choices. Uh, then, then people know. And the thing for me that's absolutely amazing is the silence in the media, the lack of reporting on television and in the general media and even on the internet, the lack of reporting how grave the situation is right now. Um, the, the, the example that every reader will understand is your memory loss. Why do you think in the last few years most of you lost significant amounts of your memory. You think it's just you? Yeah, it's 80% uh, of the population and it's serious. And how often you read that on the front page of the paper, probably not the papers would point, oh yeah, there is some people with Alzheimer's disease and we need new funding for that and all that. But it's not pointing towards you. You're suffering from this and you make some bad decisions because you don't remember all the details that you're supposed to remember. And um, that, of course, has to do with the things that I talk about, you know. And so we're trying to educate people, you know, without blaming anybody. I don't think neither in politics nor in the pharmaceutical industry nor in the cell phone industry nor in AT&T uh, is a real evil person. Yeah, I don't see that. I don't believe that. But there is fields of consciousness that have grabbed uh, many people in those decision-making positions that is absolutely scary right now for us who are not seized by those forces. Mm. Do you think they like they mind energy? Because I, I always imagined, you know, like all this spiritual energy and life force that humans aren't connected to, where is it going? If energy can't be created nor destroyed, who's eating that? You know, I always imagine there were, and can feel forces that kind of come in and eat that. I don't know if you're allowed to talk about that. <laughs> the, the Dementors from Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I know. I mean, like, I, you know, of course that we could go uh, in more into the <laughs> philosophical and religious aspects of that, but I'm, I'm shocked at the lack of response of the Christian Church to the environmental crisis. Let me give you an example of this. It was a few years ago, I tweeted a pastor of one of those mega churches, you know, when he gave a sermon with like 6,000 people there. And uh, and he was sponsoring teachings, you know, to the to his group, you know, sort of where they regularly, twice a month or so, they had like weekend get-togethers or evening meetings where they invited lecturers on it. And so he he was had, this, had developed a serious illness and ended up, in my office, you know, knowing that I could most likely help him with it. And so I asked him after a few visits and said, listen, um, I would love so much, you know, to give a talk to your audience that you have created um, regarding protecting you from Wi-Fi and cleaning up your food from glyphosate and becoming aware of the geoengineering program that's going on. He said, you stop right there. He said, you know what would happen to my church? I would lose all the sponsors. And then he pointed towards all the diamond rings on his hand. He said, I would lose all of that. He said, Dietrich, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. That was for me the end of the Christian church. You know, 
and I know other churches are, are the same, you know, sort of that um, the, the religious community have completely failed um, um, assessing the seriousness of our condition right now and translating it into teaching to their flock of people, you know, like um, Jesus pointed out the the shortcomings of his time and and had no hesitance, you know, pointing the finger towards um, the culprits and how uh, educating people, you know, in his lectures of how to bring up their life, to how to enhance their life, and some of the teachings were very practical. Uh, and that is not happening in the church right now, and so we are, we are very disappointed. Um, at least we don't see it, you know, it could be that there's nests in the country here that are waking up. And uh, I, when I moved here, you know, from Germany, uh, because of the war, it had mostly become an atheist country, because people said, if God allows the Holocaust and allows that kind of war to happen, there cannot be a God, or that God we don't want, you know. And so, when I grew up in Germany, it was largely an atheist country, and now, Religion always stays on the side of the winner in wars. And so coming over to America, I realized suddenly everybody was preaching and everybody was very deeply steeped in their religious upbringing and, and trusting in God and so on. I was kind of shocked by that and opened myself up to that again, to tiptoe my way into that until that experience and several other experiences adjacent to the one that I shared. So um, the, the trouble that we're having right now uh, there is no political group that protects the earth, not in this country. The worst group that I've seen are the Greens or the, the organized Greenpeace. Uh, Greenpeace has been invaded by all the special interests or so. It is a hopeless group. In fact, you know, if you want to see evil, you go deeply into Greenpeace. There's other groups that are, I feel are still clean, like Sea Shepherd, and, and there's a few um, outliers that are still good, but most are. Uh, the big groups have been invaded by the same forces that, that we're talking about. And so the, we don't have a politician that stands with us. In fact, you know, the Democrats right now are pushing the vaccine program without actually looking at what science is available right now that says, stop, careful, this is a bad program right now that needs to be reevaluated and redesigned, you know, Merck shop and dome. Uh, if you want to find evil on the planet, you know, sort of, um, and want to look at what company tops having come under the influence of that, I would probably start with Merck. <laughs> you know, there's a few other other things <laughs> where I would direct te people to. And so um, we don't have a political group that protects us from the toxic influences, from the Wi-Fi influences, simply because None of the politicians can be elected without money, and to get the money, they need to cooperate with the devil. And so by the time they get into office, if that's what got you there, you will not be able to lose those forces while you're there. And so we have nobody in politics who is intelligently protecting us. You know, the, the politicians, most of them are attorneys. You know, they've never read a scientific study. They don't know how to translate. Um, the seriousness of what's found in science to political action. And so we've, um, you know, we scientists, we're pretty closely linked with each other and we, we, you know, we know of the dangers of speaking up too loud and too soon. And so we're treading carefully while we're watching things getting worse and worse and nobody really dares to take the flag and say, listen, we need to stand up together and we need to stop a large number of things in order to preserve life on the planet that has evolved here over millions of years. You know, we're watching the extinction of species without any real action, you know, other than documenting it. Yes, we're beautiful in documenting the decline of conditions here, but there has been no political will to change it. I, I do feel people are far more ready for change than the politicians governing the people. And so we have a real a problem. And, and I'm, overall, I'm very positive. Yeah. I do know things will change eventually, but unfortunately, they will have to get quite a bit worse 
before there's going to be a will to change things and then and there will change and there's going to be paradise here again um you know there's no question but um there's going to be some uh, collateral damage you know until that happens you know if you cut a tree down that's a thousand years old you know sort of um it doesn't take a thousand years to grow it back it takes two thousand you know for the conditions in the soil to be right it would take another thousand years and so well basically um if you prevent destruction the effect is tomorrow if you allow destruction to happen to repair it, it may take thousands of years and so when we think in larger time scales the plan is going to be okay and we're going to be okay but if you think in terms of five or ten or twenty years we're probably not going to be okay you know? what's a group of people without memory you know sort of your, all your memory is going down right now that's part of the program that's that's unleashed on us and so you rely more and more on your computer and your cell phone on, on externalizing your memory but the computer only memorizes what you put in there there's a lot of things you don't put in that you forget and, and learning and memory hang together you know if there's no memory there's no learning and if you have a whole humanity that can't learn anymore there's devolution you know and that's that's the price we pay. Mm. What's the force that that drives you? Because you've I mean, been working for so many years, so hard, so intensely. What is it inside of you that's driving you? What does it feel like? What do you think it is? Well, the, you know, resources? you know, my my resource really is my patients. You know, a single patient that comes back and says they have improved since they started seeing me. That gives me incredible amount of joy and and pleasure you know inside and, and motivates me to do more and so you know I'm almost a hundred years old and I'm still working full-time you? <laughs> you know I'm 69 yeah and so um, I you know I love what I do but not because I'm doing it but I love it because the thankfulness of patience that's kind of what nurtures me you know and so which in a way is strange because it makes me kind of dependent on seeing patients, <laughs> <laughs> which is also exhausting. Yeah. So, and so the patients feed your adrenals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, and then none of us ever know where our life energy is coming from and what field we're connected to that works through us. I hope it's God, mm -hmm. you know, like in many of the people that I see, you know. I, I think that the few people that I mentioned that are under the dark influence it's a relatively small number but it tends to be largely people in the position of current of power and money and so but the number of us who not who are not seized by this field permanently is much larger and it's just going to be we need that tipping point yeah. what do you think uh what do you think people could do? How? What are the core, core pieces of the puzzle to, to healing? Obviously, you have thousands of hours of lectures on this, but if we could just simplify it to an audience mm -hmm. member watching this video, like what is, what are the non-negotiables that need to get mm -hmm. taken care of? Yeah, I, d I mean, I just said the patient here made a complete recovery by shielding her bedroom from Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. having uh, Brian Hoyer, he said, the guy that we use, went to the house, did the measurements, um, shielded her bedroom completely from Wi-Fi, and she made a complete recovery within really within two or three months. So number one is because the rollout of Wi-Fi, of the 5G, will increasingly damage all of our central nervous system. And the first thing is an emergency to protect your brain, at least for the time while you're sleeping. You know, and then you need some measurements, body voltage, and the, the Wi-Fi density that enters your bedroom. And it's pretty affordable to do the shielding. There's curtains on the wall. It's a particular wall paint. Um, and there's some internal protection that people can do during the daytime. 
um, I'm advising a company in England called Key Science, KI Science, mm -hmm. and they've developed a fantastic uh, skin ointment called E Shield, E like the letter E hyphen Shield, and E Shield. Uh, it's a frequency impregnated cream that actually has a very, very completely natural. There's not no chemicals in there, and it makes the the skin reflective of Wi-Fi we, that was measured and it's like ab absolutely amazing and, and that works. So daytime strategy is the e-shield. There's internal stuff that people can do. There's the same company yeah, makes this uh, uh, product called Raywave. It's actually three things that are in there. Rosemary is one of them. Uh, that has been shown to completely stabilize the cells against the damage caused by radiation coming in. So th these are three basic strategies and the most simple other one is the um, eating organic to minimize the, the, uh, the, the exposure to glyphosate and we have people follow each meal anyway with a product called Matrix Minerals that's from uh, BioPure here in the US. It's a very, very uh, sophisticated extract of fulvic acid and humic acid that has been shown in several animal studies to really extract glyphosate from your brain and from your tissues and, and excrete it. So those two are, are two key strategies, you know. The other big boogaboo, you know, is the, uh, the aluminum, nanonized aluminum exposure from the geoengineering, from the fallout that we're all inhaling and it's now in the food chain, it's in the all bodies of water. And um, the, um, uh, BioPure developed a tincture together with a number of, of scientists and, and herb herbalists. It's called Alu Tox, mm -hmm. Alu and then hyphen Tox. And uh, there's a number of herbs and again some frequencies impregnated that mobilize nano nanoparticles of aluminum from your lung and from your brain and helps to excrete it. So I, I would say these are the, the three absolutely must things. You know, the fourth one is how to get the fluoride out of the brain. So first of all, it starts with not putting any fluoride in there. So we need the uh, fluoride extracting water filter. And that's very, very difficult to do. You know, uh, we, I use one that's called Berkey. That, it comes with cartridges that are pretty good in removing the, the fluoride. We're still looking for the best source of water and it certainly will be spring water. The best water uh, in the U.S. is from Idaho, you know, from the, there's, there's different places in Idaho that have excellent uh, quality spring water. Um, I like a water from Malaysia, it's called Asilis, uh, that's silica spelled backwards, wow. you know, that also comes from key science. Uh, that's the water that Chris Axley, he's the main aluminum researcher. He did uh, f numerous studies on how to get aluminum out of the brain. And it's that water was the most effective, more, more effective than medical drugs and, and other things. Yeah. So um, these are just a few, just a few things. But um, fluoride, the only thing that mobilizes fluoride out of the brain is melatonin and high doses. Yeah. So we've been using uh, high dose melatonin as creams in the suppositories and that is dramatically effective. It's uncomfortable for a few months, you know, as the stuff comes out backwards, but it gets people's memory back. Uh, you know, fluoride is a very potent neurotoxin and when you remove that from the brain, brain functions comes back. You know, and it's a beautiful thing to see in people when the spark comes back, the vitality, the creativity, the intuition, you know, all that kind of is dependent on, you know, it's been systematically poisoned in the U.S. with our brain, you know, systematically poisoned with fluoride as a preparation for what, I don't know. Uh, and in the name of what, I don't know. I, I like to say this here because it's a thing in my heart. When I first came to the U.S., I met John Yamuyanis. He was the main fluoride researcher in the 1980s <clears throat> and I listened to his lectures, I got his science and Santa Fe where I lived at the time I was coming up to a decision to fluoridate the drinking water or not. It was not fluoridated when I moved there and so I drummed, I was a doctor, I was well known in the community so 
I drummed the community together. We were about 600 people, mostly women, <laughs> uh, mostly young mothers. I showed them, gave them all the signs that was already available, how the fluoridation of the drinking water was such a fraudulent uh, thing based on non-existing science and um, lying it about the science right. of it. So it was like I delivered all the points and two days later was the um, the public opinion polls, you know, on fluoridation and over 90% of the same people that were there voted for the fluoridation. And that's when I knew, knew we had a long uphill battle ahead. And so now the AMA, a few days ago, declared, declared you know, that they finally discovered that fluoride is really bad for you. Mm -hmm. So we need to see what happens now. I'm, I, there is, you know, like this guy, Dr. Cope, who removed um, smoking from the good list, you know, it took one man who was the Surgeon General to stop smoking worldwide. I, mean, I know there is still smoking, but it's much, much less than it used to be. It took one man to fight that battle who was in a position of power. We were hoping that uh, Donald Trump is going to improve the vaccine program and that was going to improve various other things. We've seen some positive movements under his um, presidency, uh, but he's embattled in so many battles and he made himself so unpopular the way he is talking and presenting himself that he's weakened his own position in order to make any major changes, you know, that we were hoping for. And so, um, yes, we need educated people in positions of executive power and things can change like the smoking did, you know, took one man against everybody else who did that. And this guy should get a Nobel Prize. What's his name? I think his name was Coop, K-O-O-P. Or one man brought fluoride in, right? Edward Bernays was kind of the big like, yeah. marketing genius behind yeah. it. Yeah. Um, So I, I think, you know, overall, because of the things that I see, I have a positive outlook, mm -hmm. you know, on life. It's just being deeply steeped in where the problems are right now. It's like, oh my God, you know, it's just like a, but also we were able through the work with patients. We don't have thousands of problems. We have four problems, <laughs> Wi-Fi, <laughs> glyphosate, or let's call it agrochemicals, aluminum in the air, and fluoride in the water. If you could solve those four things, America would move from the worst health country to the healthiest country within maybe two or three years. It wouldn't take very long. Um, but right now, that is left up to Russia. You know, the, we, we can see that in sports, you know, sort of that the healthiest athletes that win everything come either from the former Balkan countries, they don't have fluoride in the water, they, the infrastructure was destroyed so they hardly have any Wi-Fi, <laughs> um, they don't have money for paying for farming chemicals, they have very rich soil, they don't spray, uh, they, they produce the Djokovic and the this and the that in terms of athletes. Um, the Russians have fallen behind a little bit on the athletic level, but in terms of intelligence, collective intelligence, the Russians are no way ahead of anybody else. The Chinese protect their people from Wi-Fi, you know, pregnant women have to wear protective clothing. Um, they use other frequencies in Wi-Fi they have shown to not be biologically so damaging, but they're selling us the 5G using all the destructive stuff, using themselves other frequencies, so they're smart, you know, they kind of know they don't have to do enter a war with the U.S. They just can wait until the U.S. commits suicide, and then they can shine, you know. And that's pretty much what we're witnessing. And I like to emphasize that you, you know, I love the U.S. I'm here by choice. Most of you who who listen to this are here by fate. You were born here, or some things have washed you here. I choose to be here because I love this country. 
and I'm as long as I can, I will make my voice heard. Mm. Uh, I have a personal question about uh, tonsils because I heard you talk about these four things, mm. and I've been working on those four things for a long time, and I seem to have this block in my tonsils. Mm -hmm. I'm going to Dr. Dora Chauvin. I know we're kind of moving into this big scope into personal mm -hmm. questions, but I'm going to Dora Chauvin next week. Mm -hmm. um, how important is it for tonsils, like to, for people with years of chronic illness, how important is it for people to get that taken care of before any of this mm -hmm. other stuff? Mm -hmm. So the most uh, common blockage that we find in people is the anterior neck. And there's two major things, three major things that are here. One is the vagus nerve that's now becoming popular in neurology to actually look at the health of that. I did that in my thesis 40 years ago. Um, the other thing that's here is the drainage from the brain, both the lymphatic drainage and the venous drainage, which kind of follows this structure here. And the tonsils are a big lymph node, or really group of lymph nodes in the lymphatic drainage of the brain. And if you have chronic tonsillitis or microbes uh, setting up the housekeeping there, they block the lymph flow. It can't go past the tonsils. And if the lymph flow from the brain, which mostly happens at night, doesn't happen, the brain builds up toxins and metabolic waste. Um, and the overall perfusion of the brain go decreases. And, and then adjacent to that problem is that the uh, microbes, uh, like uh, Lyme spirochetes and, and certain viruses, um, they're all addicted to the neurotransmitters that we're creating and the richest place to actually eat or benefit from our neurotransmitters is the venous drainage of the brain yeah, that's full of these neuropeptides and so the uh, many of the pathogens love living in the veins here but then it has a consequence that the immune system attacks them there and that creates inflammation in these veins and they narrow down mm. and when the veins are narrow blood cannot leave the brain, and that means it can also not go in. So you, people get a, a decreased perfusion of the brain. This is now the status of almost everybody. Mm. And and so to open that up, um, the tonsils have a huge role in that. You know, so that we try to optimize the health of the tonsils either by freezing them, the regenerative cryotherapy that's called, as Dr. Dorhoff in, in Germany, He's a Russian brilliant physician. He's a, by training a pediatrician and ENT physician. He's double boarded, brilliant uh, man. But uh, we also use tonsillectomy sometimes as needed. We also have developed a, a manual lymph drainage massage you know, using a cream called Sophia Flow from Sophia Nutrition um, that has been shown to um, chase the microbes out of the venous system and out of the lymphatic system and improve the general health in this area. So there is more blood flowing out of the brain and more blood can go in. And also the lymphatic clearing that happens at night is, is uh, emphasized. And so mm -hmm. I think what you plan on doing to go to Germany, you have the tonsils uh, frozen, is a very good step, but it should be accompanied you know, with some of the other, uh -huh. other tools. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, what do you think about the Atlas? Uh, do you refer your clients to any chiropractors who put the Atlas back in place, like Blair or Nuka? Because in yeah. my journey, I, it was essential for me to have my Atlas mm, back in yeah. place. Yeah, the orthogonal uh, treatment of the Atlas. Um, the um, So the, the Atlas is, in my uh, osteopathic understanding from the osteopaths I worked with, the position of the atlas really is crucial for the functioning of the vagus nerve, mm. <laughs> which passes right by it. You know, there's different theories why repositioning the atlas, optimizing the relationship of the atlas to the occiput and to the rest of the spine, can have such a foundational influence on the on the health of the body. We know it immediately normalizes functions in the autonomic nervous system, which was I consider myself an expert because I did my thesis on it, you know, but there's many, many uh, ideas why NUCA works, but my working idea is uh, it has a key function in the autonomic nervous system, the position of the atlas, and especially on the vagus nerve. 
and we can measure that in it with heart rate variability we can show after a good nuca adjustment the vagus normalizes and your lungs function you 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 have better oxygen exchange your liver detox function the kidney start uh, producing a proper it has a effect on every every major system you know but i think um we are not underutilizing we send people regularly um to have that have that done and we uh, you know when we through with our patients you know with treating Lyme disease and treating ebv and treating the toxicity of people um the the further results we get with nuca are maybe less dramatic than when nuca is done at the beginning of the journey but then as you know then it needs to be repeated you know then you relapsing as long as the toxins and the other things are unattended the atlas will go out again and you have to do it again and then we're concerned about as long as it's based on x-rays you know the radiation exposure is quite serious you know and increases your risks of leukemia and other things later in life so we we trying to find our way in that but um i have high respect for that in general you know i've learned more from uh, chiropractic uh, medicine than i have learned from conventional medicine mm-hmm. in the last 50 years really mm. yeah um i have one more question for you mm. it's up to you i mean what's what's your time yeah that's no, yeah. okay yeah okay so i keep the answer short yeah well i'm okay it's up to you but mm. um so uh ear infections i recently this is like embarrassing to admit to my audience i have mm. gone on antibiotics in seven years mm. and literally a week ago i was swimming in this lagoon and i got this horrible ear infection i tried for three days to get rid of it with colloidal mm. silver and mm. garlic juice and and a couple of other things mm. I, I gave up. I had to go on antibiotics for the first mm-hmm. time in seven mm-hmm. years. So my mm-hmm. questions, and I'm trying to personally receive knowledge here while helping my audience at the same time. Mm-hmm. What can we do about ear infections to prevent going on antibiotics? Mm-hmm. And if someone's taking antibiotics, myself, how do we mitigate the damage? Because I can, I feel horrible on them. Mm-hmm. Actually, I feel yeah. the worst I felt in years because mm-hmm. of these antibiotics. Mm-hmm. Actually, yeah. So, yeah. F- uh, so first of all, something I learned in my years from India, if it's an external ear infection or so on this side of the eardrum on the outside of the eardrum there's a very simple treatment that works 100% of the time which we did this a week ago and uh, that is buying spending 5 bucks on rubbing alcohol you lie on the side and you pour rubbing alcohol and you fill it up you lie there for 5 minutes it gets a little bit warm uh-huh. and then you empty it out and as the rubbing alcohol uh evaporates and completely dries the tissues up and none of the ear infections can live in a dry environment they need the moisture mm-hmm. you know and so it's usually one treatment is enough sometimes you have to do it at the most three times in a row but then it's also recommended now every time you have a bath you know where you immerse yourself with get water in there for a few weeks you know sort of to or if you have a shower and some of our ears like i got ears you know where the water kind of runs in and doesn't drain out easily so you just take an extra few minutes after this lie on the side put the alcohol in and you will never have an ear infection again you know so this is just um something people don't know and it's of course Johnson and Johnson will not tell you that even though they're providing very good alcohol but <laughs> <laughs> um, it uh, nobody's uh, earning much money on it but you had another part of the question that i forgot the other part was now that i'm on antibiotics for the first time in 7 years yeah. mm-hmm. what do i do to mitigate these effects i feel sensitive i feel tired i feel mm-hmm. very very not like myself right now yeah and i'm wondering yes. what i can do so you know of course the, the, you could easily get paranoid and say oh my god you know i destroyed 99% of my gut microbiome which you probably did but most of it would come back within a few weeks some take a few months or so and the the ideal thing in the future so the ideal future treatment for that that we know works is if you know we do that with some of our Lyme patients choose to go on months of antibiotic treatment which I'm not in favor of because we don't see it working better than the herbal treatments we do but some people make that choice and we are recommending to take your poop a few poops before you start you put you make about 
30 or so capsules you put it in capsules put it in the freezer and then you do your antibiotics and when you're done with the antibiotics you do a 30 day course taking over after a meal taking one of the capsules and it has the entire microbiome in it as you had it before you took antibiotics and it very quickly within a few days will restore your normal microbiome yeah so this is for the future but right now you know it's really um, you need to take prebiotics you know the stuff that feeds the healthy bugs and not the bad bugs um, you need to take um, a good probiotics we like the mega spore as part of it you know sort of and you need to have a good uh, colostrum extract that, that speeds up uh, things and I, I strongly know that you have to take some matrix minerals to take the glyphosate out of the food that you're eating. I mentioned that before because that will push the regrowth of your flora in the direction of Clostridia and Salmonella that's all published, you know. And so it's a vulnerable phase where the bugs, as they're coming back, as they're recovering from the antibiotics, it tends to be some of the evil bugs recover quicker than your good bugs. And if there's any glyphosate in the food or residues in your gut, um, the evil bugs will grow much, much faster than the other ones, and then that becomes the new normal, you know? And so uh, it's a mix of those things, but I wouldn't worry too much. I mean, you've, I know you've had some illness in the past and stuff, and so you're traumatized, and yeah. your level of fear is gonna be bigger than, exactly. um, than the, the, the real danger, you know? It's you, like, it's this weird thing of like, I'm so far removed from, from that world of hell, but when the slightest smell of hell comes back, yeah, it's literally like, oh my God, I'm back there. Yeah, I'm there. Of course. And yeah. I never left. Yeah. And it's, like, it's such an illusion, you mm -hmm. know, because my life is amazing now and I have all of these amazing people mm -hmm. and connections. And, 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 and it's like that trauma from that level of mm -hmm. illness is, it's, you know, it's, it's left you with a high level of yeah. vigilance. And some of that is good. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. want to take that all yeah. away from you, just yeah. to temper it a little bit. Yeah. yeah.